We are absolutely honoured uh, to welcome Kieran Martin to speak to you all today. He's currently a Professor of Practice in the Management of Public Organisations at the Blavatnik School of Government at Oxford University. Prior to this, he was the CEO and founder of the National Cybersecurity Centre and has held many senior government positions, as well as being the head of cybersecurity at GCHQ. It's my personal privilege to introduce Kieran Martin. Uh, the stage is yours. <laughs> Um, thank you very much, Charlie. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, sorry, I can't see you. Um, but really honoured that you wanted me um, here. Um, Charlie's already ruined the substance of what I was going to say, because my standard spiel is all about demythologizing cybersecurity away from stereotypes. But when he says you can spot us wearing red and black hoodies, I mean, really, they should be black or green. But you know, apart from that, thank you for conforming to all of the um, stereotypes, because as we all know, all hackers are um, under 20. Uh, male uh, wearing um, uh, hoodies and what you don't have Charlie but I think you need it for the next time is a big black screen behind you with green ones and zeros are just floating um, uh, um, um, past so I will try and deal with some of those um, myths because you know actually um, one of the reasons I survived in cybersecurity is quite you know it's a very very rewarding and worthy uh, career um, and I, I loved it but um, uh, one of the reasons I survived in it is I, I, quite a lot of it whilst very useful is quite boring um, and uh, I will try to make um, I, I will try to achieve a paradox by telling you why um, boring cybersecurity can be quite interesting in terms of um, um, uh, what you do um, so just a little bit about who I am um, um, and the way that uh, tonight can uh, work. So my name is Kieran Martin. Um, I, uh, I'm not a technologist, so I'm conscious that I'm speaking to um, a group of people who are a digital natives because I'm 46 and you're a lot younger than that, I imagine, most of you, um, even though I can't see you. Um, so I'm not a digital native and I wasn't a techie, I was a history graduate. Um, um, and uh, when I was asked to come to GCHQ to um, head up uh, cybersecurity, and ultimately then develop some ideas to find the National Cybersecurity Center within GCHQ. And my first um, response to the <clears throat> director of GCHQ, Serene Lobin, an absolute hero of a person who asked me to join, uh, was, but Ian, I wouldn't appoint myself to this job. So why are you, uh, what, why are you appointing me? Uh, in fact, I owed my job. Um, I don't say this too much, too loudly, but um, you can repeat it if you want. I basically owe my job to Edward Snowden uh, because, um, what had happened was was that GCHQ had lived in more or less total secrecy for 94 years uh, from 1919 uh, until 2013 and then uh, it, whilst other uh, organizations had um, uh, whilst other um, secret organizations had to open up a bit because of controversy GCHQ was immune from all of that and then Snowden basically by disclosing you, you if you ever go on to corporate boards or so and you'll get used to risk registers Snowden was off the charts as a risk it was beyond what anybody in wildly imagined you know somebody walking out with nearly two million documents from the National Security Agency including you know tens of thousands of GCHQ ones and so it was a political crisis for an organization that was not used to <clears throat> um, having any political crises at all. It had a press office that dealt with the Gloucestershire Echo and community events in Cheltenham uh, and was now not just getting calls from the Times and the Telegraph and the Guardian but it was getting calls from the Washington Post and Der Spiegel and so forth. So they hired me to try and put out that fire but then um, to get involved in, um, in, in, uh, in, in, in cyber security. And the reason I tell that story is that I think that um, I'm just looking at the chat and by the way just put questions in the chat or put comments in the chat or tell me this is rubbish and it's not what you came to hear and I'll try and divert um, uh, I'll try and keep going um, um, according to what's useful for you but the, the reason for this is is that I think that um, you know, internet security and confidence in technology is one of the great and most important public policy issues of our time it's most of the most important community issues of our time I mean we've just been through or we're coming through hopefully coming out at the end of a deadly pandemic that's confined most of us to home for more than a year um a huge social health and economic cost um one of the few mitigations of that period has been technology um you know it's it's why we're able to it's why i mean i know the student experience charlie isn't what it might have been um and what it should have been um in the, in the last year but at least it's been something uh at least on the educational side and as a teacher at a university i i i, I know that I know, I mean, my parents live on the other side of the Irish Sea. I've not seen them since March the 11th, 2020. 
but I have kept in touch with them quite closely and, you know, they've seen my children uh, and so forth. So technology has sort of, it hasn't saved us, it's still been an awful year, but it has mitigated harm and carnage of the last year and kept many of us going partially, at least professionally and, and personally. Think of a year where, um, uh, think, of a, think of the events of the last year where um, technology had failed let's say in one of two in, in either of two ways one was the technology companies hadn't coped with the increased demand you know zoom had fallen over um bt just couldn't cope with the extra wi-fi demands you know in the united kingdom it, it, it would have been awful i mean i um, was delighted actually in the new in the birthday honors list in the middle of last summer to see some bt and vodafone engineers uh, honoured because I mean these people were climbing poles at two o'clock in the morning to keep the villages connected to the internet. You know it's, it's it is actually heroic stuff. It's not quite the same as frontline medical service, but it was good stuff that they kept going. But the other thing is, what if we'd had a secure? What if we'd had a major security crisis in the last? Um, you know, um, you know, comprehensive collapse in public confidence in technology. Things would have been even worse. So, um, the reason I mention that is that. Um, uh, you know, I think um, having um, come out from uh, to, uh, to, to, to GCHQ um, to deal with a political crisis and then look at cybersecurity, I quickly found that um, cybersecurity, you know, and it was an intensely technical subject, but one with massive real world ramifications. And the two communities, if you like, the expert community who really understood the technology and the hacking and all of that, um, with the political decision takers, uh, just um, uh, didn't know how to talk to each other. So in a sense, um, what my journey was about was trying to learn enough of how the technology worked, or at least how to talk to the people who did, so that I could then relay that to people all the way up to you know three different prime ministers about how to safeguard um, the UK. Um, so uh, in order, uh, so my, my uh, story was, you know, I did a bit of, I did about six months of firefighting on um, the Snowden uh, leaks, and then I looked quite carefully at um, at uh, what was happening in UK cybersecurity. We made some changes. We set up the National Cybersecurity Centre, a much more public facing part of GCHQ, because we realised that cybersecurity was about what 66 million people did uh, online, not what um, happened in the secret state um, uh, and so on. I'll come on to that in a bit. But I just wanted to sort of, you know, try, I'll, I'll try an experiment, which may or may not work. And if it's not working, just put it in the chat and tell me to move on, you know, tell some jokes or something. Um, uh, I thought what I'd try to do is give you an impression of what that first period felt like through the prism of the, um, uh, of the last six months. Um, uh, you know, the sort of 2020 to 21 period. So in other words, think of somebody like me, a history graduate who'd done jobs in the treasury, you know, British Finance Ministry, who'd done some some jobs in the Cabinet Office. In fact, my previous job was Constitution Director in the Cabinet Office, which, given that you're in Edinburgh, involved, amongst other things, negotiating the terms with Alex Salmond and Nicola Sturgeon for the 2014 referendum uh, skills, which I have now happily put in abeyance, so I'm not available for recall should they be um, uh, should they be needed. Um, uh, I think um, um, uh, when, when you think about that and then think about what would that be like if you were put into um, the last six months where you know you get there and then something like the solar winds hack happens and in the solar winds hack so you see that you know you hear in the news um, that the Russians are believed to have infiltrated the US Treasury the US Department of Justice um, uh, on one day it was reported um, that they had infiltrated the US uh, nuclear weapons agency um, and indeed, I sort of complained to the BBC that they maybe might have done a bit more to uh, say that it was the enterprise systems of the US Nuclear Weapons Agency rather than imply that they had completely compromised the US Nuclear Weapons Agency for, all, for, for obvious reasons. And then you have senators um, uh, talking about this being um, an act of war. Now, presumably in that sort of situation, you will get, given the UK is such a close ally of the US, you will get somebody like Downing Street saying, well, you know, A, is the UK affected? B, you know, some very senior and serious Americans are talking about this as an act of war. What, what's going on? And then you think about this and then you have to learn about, you know, the age old um, art of espionage and the way in which that's done in the modern digital uh, environment. And you have to learn some nuance. You know, you've you've seen the myth of the hoodie of, of the of, of the of, of the of the hooded hacker. We've talked about it already, but you have to think about, well, 
actually this is a bunch of people probably in uniform certainly sitting in a very organized um, way under military direction or intelligence service direction in russia doing a very careful limited and targeted hack of the kind that western agencies such as the nsa and gchq do through a you know um, super smart compromise of a, um, of a of of a security of a software update um, via uh, solar winds, then very stealthily selecting you know a, a small number of targets, discarding all the rest of them that they could have um, um, accessed, staying there as quietly as they can for as long as they can, and then when they're found out, they leave. And you think, okay, so is that an act of war? And, you know, some senior minister in the UK government asks you, well, but, but I've read this as an act of war. And just even understanding that and realizing, no, that is a traditional act of espionage, which is hugely strategically damaging for the US, but not actually in, you know, in, in moral terms, you can say the US was um, uh, was harmed, but not wronged by that attack. And you swiftly begin to think, right, so here's how I approach uh, and understand a bunch of sort of you know semi-technical details about what a software update is, how it works, um, how um, concepts of what you know people call no one but us. In other words, the hackers are pretty confident that only they know about the access, and they're very careful and so forth, and quite responsible about it. And um, how that works. Hold that thought, because then you've got the uh, Microsoft Exchange um, server um, hack, uh, apparently according to Microsoft, done by the Chinese. And this is a little bit different. Firstly, it's not, um, you know, so, uh, you know, again, think about the narrative you're getting from decision takers and the heart of whatever government you're working for. And they're saying, well, first it was this sort of, you know, near act of war by Russia, now it's China, what's going on? And then you have to say, well, this moment might be quite different. Because firstly, it's not that clever. It's the exploitation of one of the 2000 vulnerabilities that get disclosed every year. Um, it's much larger scale because instead of the sort of 20,000 targets that SolarWinds give you, it's about 400,000 targets, according to Microsoft's uh, figures. Um, uh, but the 400,000 targets are actually on average less, uh, 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 less, um, I'm coming to the point in the chat in a minute, uh, 400,000 less high value uh, targets. So it is more indiscriminate than SolarWinds because in SolarWinds they, initial, uh, uh, in SolarWinds they initially uh, got access to tens of thousands of targets, but they shut down those accesses pretty um, uh, quickly in, in my uh, uh, um, understanding of it because they didn't um, discard it. And actually, and I've said this publicly, um, it you know that sort of large scale initial access close most of it down and select the high value targets is almost identical to an affidavit or witness statement in British English that I swore in a court of law in 2015 when defending GCHQ's actions um, in a legal challenge post Snowden. You know our philosophy as exposed uh, as um, exposed in that court statement under law is digital espionage requires large scale accesses but then responsible digital um, um, uh, hackers. Um, uh, acting under law will then discard most of those um, accesses. In the Rush, in this particular Russian case, I'm not saying Russia always hacks responsibly. Um, I think um, uh, uh, they stopped short of doing what they did, for example, to the um, uh, to the American Democratic Party in 2016. Um, if you think back to what the Americans did, or sorry, what the Russians did to Hillary Clinton in 2016, it was a two pronged um, operation. So the first prong was they hacked the DNC server and took information out of it. And they also hacked somebody's Gmail, but let's not complicate things. Um, given that, as we will remember, although history didn't turn out that way, um, Secretary Clinton was the odds on favorite to become the next president of the United States. It would have been pretty unusual if the Russian state hadn't been trying to spy on her. And I don't think that anybody would have complained that much. What then violated, um, you know, accepted standards of behavior was that they did a data dump designed to destabilize the election. In SolarWinds, they haven't done any of that subsequent disruptive um, uh, or malevolent um, activity. They just seem to have spied. By contrast, when the um, allegedly Chinese hackers were seen to be um, um, knew that Microsoft were going to close the vulnerability, we're going to close uh, the accesses, uh, they appear through the um, uh, large scale um, deployment of web shell um, script onto all of the victims. They appear to have booby trapped the infrastructure so that they not just could they return, but anybody else could return. And some of my friends in the US, um, you, you others will have your own connections, are telling me that 
there is an uptick in ransomware and I see that the um, Norwegian Parliament and the European Banking Authority have both said that they have been indirectly compromised but not by the um, uh, not by the Chinese so you know you're then saying to your political masters well this Chinese thing could actually be more serious because it could be that through um, probably um, well possibly unintentional I very much doubt it was a, the direct order of President Xi or somebody else high ranking but they decided that they were going to you know basically poison quite a lot of American digital infrastructure um, in a way that meant that those who could least afford the um, the capabilities to um, go and get rid of this uh, these intrusions um, were able to um, find it so there you've got two um, you know seemingly similar you know sort of passive non-kinetic uh, non-disruptive uh, initially uh, state-backed hack, uh, state -backed hacks but actually they're quite different and you think of the response as being quite different um then you turn to and you're staying in america so um uh, which tends to provide all of the best um uh, examples but then you switch on and you see the oldsmar florida water plant and this is both unusual and, um, and as i put it on the media um quite um sort of terrifying and reassuring in equal measure and this comes back to the sort of you know the, the cybergeddon stuff you know that we're all going to die um you know matthew broderick i know it's before many of the audience um will have been born but the matthew broderick 1983 or four film war games where you know he guesses a password and hacks into the pentagon and you know starts playing global thermonuclear war and launches all the weapons I mean, there's a bit of that in Oldsmar where it appears that somebody um, um, possibly, although I don't I haven't caught up with the latest, I don't think there is any latest, a disgruntled employee um, uh, hacks into um, TeamViewer, a moribund version of TeamViewer, and um, suddenly is at the controls of the um, chemical uh, uh, balances of the water supply and decides it'll be quite fun to pump up the sodium hydroxide um, content. Um, and that's terrifying that you can change the chemical composition of a drinking water plant from accessing TeamViewer. Uh, so that's the terrifying bit. The reassuring bit, there are two reassuring bits. Uh, one is that um, somebody who was actually sitting there at the controls just went, what the hell is that? And said, right, um, can we stop this, please? Because there's something weird going on. Um, but apparently had that not happened, you know, there are things like pH checks. Uh, that go out to the um, uh, that you know um, will will we'll make sure that um, uh, that nothing like this um, uh, gets out the um, uh, uh, gets out the door, um, and and that those um, and, and 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 that those kicked in. So um, I mean that was an unusual reminder of the a possible vulnerability of critical in, um, of critical infrastructure of sort of hardware plants, but at the same time, um, actually you know. Um, uh, I have uh, I have the book in front of me, which I treat as a sort of secular Bible, um, which I, if you can see it, Thomas Ridd's Cyber War Will Not Take Place, which although written um, in the last digital century, i.e. 2013, I think is a text, you know, it's one of the few classics of, um, of, of cyberspace, because actually what it takes you through is just the, you know, um, while cyber, um, can't, whilst the cyber domain is clearly a contested um, uh, 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 space, um, its its capacity to cause through things like that is actually limited by the fact that it's uh, it's an indirect activity um in other words you know you may hack um you know somebody could be hacking into this now but they can't actually punch us in the face um uh, 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 digitally and they will find it hard to turn off um systems having said all that when the oldsmar case came along um uh, older uh, cybersecurity veterans pointed out that in australia in the year 2000 a disgruntled employee had done pretty much the same thing as oldsmar and he'd succeeded Unfortunately for his village, he worked in a sewage plant and had managed to discharge most of the effluent um, uh, into the um, local environment, which gave him a few um, rather um, unpleasant um, uh, weeks. But so far, um, you know, so um, uh, so sort of strategic on the one hand, SolarWinds and the Microsoft Exchange, uh, then um, Oldsmar, the sort of scary end of um, cybersecurity, and then. Um, what you have here, um, here, um, you're, you're here. I'm, I'm not. Um, in Scotland, you have the um, environment, the Scottish Environmental Protection Agency ransomware attack, and actually, um, you know, let's say by now I've worked myself into this job, and I'm thinking, you know, these things are very, very different um, than what I was told. Um, 
uh, you know, when I started, I remember um, going to see a senior aide to um, the, the then prime minister and saying, you know, what does this government think about um, cyber security? And they just said, where's the red button, which I think shows you the sort of level of public understanding. And it was all this myth and hype. And my team at GCHU were telling me, you know, we've got to get the message out that cyber is actually a sort of chronic rather than catastrophic um, uh, 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 risk. It's as much about criminality rather than states and so forth. And it's about, you know, it's about people's sort of digital um, and economic uh, well-being and so on, um, rather than, you know, sort of the warlike um, uh, uh, dimension of it. And um, I remember saying, right, I will do that. And I had prepared a speech. I walked out onto the stage in my first cybersecurity conference. He said, oh, well, the pre-conference video comes on first. And the pre-conference video was um, people screaming in a dark city because all the lights had been turned out, the ATMs were emptied, power stations had been set on fire by cyber attack and all sorts of other things that hadn't happened. So then when you turn to what happened in Scotland at the turn of this year, this was to my very last day after six and a half years in office, this was the sort of thing that actually gave me nightmares. People said, what keeps you awake at night? And it wasn't a big Russian hack. We were kind of trained for that. You know, we had elite capabilities at GCHQ. We had all these, co you know, we had the covert accesses and the brilliant people and all of that. And in a sense, you could say, um, you know, we might have got it wrong because it was, um, you know, they were, you know, the Russians or the Chinese on a good day are very, very good. But that's the sort of thing that you um, prepare for and so forth. And it's the sort of thing you expect. And there is a, you know, thing where, um, you know, there's almost a sort of professional respect for um, uh, the adversary's uh, competence and so forth. And, you know, the best defenders will want to test themselves against those sorts of um, uh, uh, challenges. But what happened in Scotland with the Scottish Environmental Protection Agency is the sort of thing that kept me awake because it was the sort of low level, but, um, uh, you know, potentially uh, devastating criminal attack on a public service, particularly these days via ransomware. So, you know, um, uh, I'll come back to the Scotland case in, in, in a minute. And for those who don't know, the Scottish Environmental Protection Agency has had uh, a ransomware attack uh, running uh, since, um, uh, since January. But when the pandemic started, um, the big worry, um, both here and in the US, I mean, I talked to my friend Chris Krebs a lot about it, was um, not, um, uh, you know, the big strategic sort of great game stuff. It was that someone who was going to ransomware a hospital. Um, and it was becoming endemic, epidemic, um, uh, if you'll excuse the phrase, given the context. Um, in the Czech Republic, there were a few ransomware um, attacks in Germany. Germany's early um, success in containing the pandemic was at one stage put at risk because there's a company called Fresenius, which makes quite a lot of um, uh, healthcare um, equipment in Germany. And it couldn't work for a while because it was ransomware. And then in what um, came close to being categorized as the first death attributable directly to a cyber attack, it wasn't the Russians, it wasn't the Chinese, it wasn't, you know, for those who take a different view of the world than I do, it wasn't the American state, it wasn't a state, it was a bunch of criminals who ransomware the admission system from a hospital and they had to turn away an ambulance and the patient died on the way to a different um, um, hospital. Now the German authorities couldn't actually, um, uh, the German authorities couldn't, um, prove causality, so they never formally charged it as a negligent homicide, despite the fact that's what they were um, investigating. Um, so that sort of scourge of ransomware, you know, because ransomware, certainly ransomware that just seeks to lock you out of your system so that you can, um, so you have to pay a ransom because you're hemorrhaging money, um, was so frustrating. And in the summer of 2019, I remember there was an, uh, an attack, a ransomware attack on a company called Eurofins that you've probably never heard of, but they're based in Brussels. Um, I'd never heard of them either. The problem with this Brussels-based Eurofins company was that they supplied 60% of um, forensic um, crim criminal and forensic investigation capability to England and Wales as police forces. So you're lucky in Scotland, but there was a few days when it was, um, although um, through very good incident management, uh, it didn't come out. There were a few days where technically it could have been quite a good time to commit low-level crime in um, in England and Wales um, because of uh, constraints and forensic capacity, and the police did a brilliant job managing um, uh, the, 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 the shortfall. But it's that sort of thing where ransomware in a critical public service or a critical company um, just absolutely sh uh, causes that horrible second-order effect. A hosp hospital bookings can't be... Um, um, 
uh, uh, can't be uh, honoured. Um, forensic capacity in the police goes down. You know, other cases, um, you know, involved um, vulnerable children's services and so forth. And in Scotland, the Environmental Protection Agency's um, uh, ability to function. The one code I'll put on that is that SEPA in Scotland have done something that I find uh, very um, commendable, uh, which is they've joined the small but thankfully slightly increasing group of people who have refused to pay ransoms. Um, because this is encouraging the sort of um, um, the um, epidemic of um, of ransomware. So that just gives you a sense of the sort of stuff that you have to deal with. And um, some um, uh, uh, some themes I would draw um, uh, from that are as follows. Firstly, you know, none of it comes close to war. You know, I've just written a piece, if you're interested, for Prospect magazine, it was published about two hours ago. Um, just you know, expressing a little bit of concern at the government's integrated um, uh, uh, review, um, um, because I think you know, whilst a lot of it is very commendable and the stuff about um, Chinese uh, technology and the challenge of that and the strategic challenge of that is um, is a really really coherent piece of public policy. Um, you know, it's a bit um, it's a bit um, what my friend Chris Painter, an American diplomat on cyber, calls um, uh, it's a bit cyber rattling. You know, it's all about we will you know, we will project cyber power through the force of this and the force of that uh, and so on. Whereas actually, you know, all of this stuff. I mean, the elite state stuff was espionage. Um, the Oldsmore, Florida stuff was probably somebody messing about, but getting close to. Um, uh, uh, but getting close to, you know, closer than he or she should have done to probably he, given the demographics of hackers, um, uh, but um, getting closer than he should have done to uh, causing harm, to disruption of public service, presumably by criminals like SEPA and what's happened in hospitals. So it was very far from the sort of um, uh, war. The other thing is, I know Andrew Thompson, who I hope was here, um, messaged me on Twitter to say, you know, um, Will we be talking about the same old in three to five years time uh, or will there be a bunch of new threats i'll come on to that in a minute but um i was reflecting on that because actually um if you'd asked me a year ago i would have said you know threats are beginning to change but all of those four were old favorites they've been around for years you know the espionage the, the sort of really good espionage espionage attack the slightly crap espionage attack that seems to have been a bit reckless uh, the ransomware attack um, and the, you know, let's try and take out a water plant. Um, they've all been around for ages. So there's been a, a sort of persistence um, of ancient um, uh, 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 of, 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 of ancient threats. Um, there's a thing around the lack of relevance of targeting. Um, you know, um, everybody is um, at risk. Some are more at risk of others. But the whole point about, um, you know, I'm you know, I, I, I'm not a target. I mean, unless you've got very good um, uh, pretension. Sorry, Mike. Did I not say Mike Thompson? Um, uh, if, if I got your name wrong, Mike, I'm, I apologize. Um, I hope I answered your question. Um, but um, uh, um, I, I remember that the most difficult six week, the most difficult period I have is a six week period in the summer of 2017. And, you know, you can do all, we did loads of exercises about preparing for major um, hacks and all the rest of it. Um, but um, uh, in, in, in the summer of 2017, in a six week period, we had two events. One was the so-called WannaCry attack where North Koreans tried to ransomware some Asian banks, but it went viral literally. And uh, it took out the announcements at German railway platforms and the hospital booking systems in England and Wales. Thankfully, it didn't kill anybody. But I mean, you know, I do remember uh, you know, this is Britain, um, it's uh, it's um, hacks on the NHS and it's in the middle of a general election campaign. That was where you really needed the fusion of the technical with the um, uh, with the um, uh, political. Uh, and then six weeks later, the Russians attacked a professional services firm in Ukraine um, and uh, Maersk shipping loses a quarter of a billion dollars. Um, some London advertising agencies lose not dissimilar amounts of money. But my, my favorite, and I feel bad about using this, um, but, you know, the Russians attack a professional services firm in Ukraine and they disrupt production at a chocolate factory in Tasmania, which is, I think, my all time favorite sort of um, uh, sort of cyber uh, viral um, um, story. But the final thing, and this is where the uh, prospect um, thing comes in, is that, that, you know, all of this is about insecure infrastructure. Um, and insecure digital practices and just the fact that you know the digital technology isn't safe enough that's why the prospect piece just says look are you really sure that you know slightly aggressive rhetoric about projecting cyber power is where we want our focus to be rather than fixing the um, infrastructure that we use in free and open societies 
And this brings me, I will, I will start to wind down in a bit, but this brings me to, um, you know, uh, how, how it looks in the, in, 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 in the future. Because the way we started to try, uh, under my leadership at the National Cybersecurity Centre, the way we started to try to deal with this was to do um, um, uh, four, uh, uh, four things. Um, one was um, sort of, you know, mitigation. You know, we would do our best to detect through elite GCHQ capabilities, but also to manage, um, to detect um, attacks. But we would also do our best to manage attacks when they got through. So instead of doing what happened when Talk Talk were hacked in 2014, 2015, sorry, um, and letting a sort of, you know, poxy little hack run wild in the media where lots of people were terrified and started cancelling their subscriptions and, and, and um, thinking that their bank accounts were about to be um, emptied, which was never true. You know, it was a sort of public facing, a bit like the chief medical officer every day during the pandemic. You know, if there was a cyber crisis, I had to go on and sort of tell everybody what was happening and, and all the rest of it. So that was one thing. Um, but um, we did uh, two other um uh, we did two other things um which i think were quite interesting and genuinely sort of innovative one was we decided that um you know one of the problems was that um we were making it too hard for people to use the internet safely uh there's all this rubbish about people are the weakest link well that was, in my view that's a bit like sort of saying that sports teams are all fine apart from the players you know i mean technology exists to serve people and if it doesn't work for people then um, it doesn't work. And I remember my favourite one was a senior British politician. You can probably work out who it is. Um, but he once, uh, as a lawyer, he once argued an almost unwinnable case at the European Court of Human Rights um, in French and won the case. And then he said to me, uh, he said, when I joined the government, you know, they gave me this, um, they gave me this tech and it was just, you know, the security things. Were, I mean, I'm so bad at technology, I couldn't use it. And I said, no, that's our fault. You know, you're, uh, you're, clever lawyer in the cabinet you i saw in the news that you argued an impossible legal case in french if you can't use your damn phone that the government gave you that's the government's fault it's not yours you know because he kept blocking himself out i think the greatest threat to winning that case was the fact that he couldn't access his phone because there were too many complicated passwords and you know dongles and all the rest of it you know that just doesn't work we got to make this um um easy to use the third thing was um just make some strategic interventions into the internet um, in, in the internet ecosystem why aren't people more people using uh, DMARC to authenticate their domains? I mean, it doesn't protect them, but it protects society as a whole. So famously, when HMRC came to us and said, look, does it, what, what about this DMARC thing um, to protect us from brands? Because we'd um, studied through the GCHQ data, we'd worked out that um, HMRC as the tax authority was Britain's most spoofed brand. So uh, we worked with them, and in the first year of the pilot, um, you know, on the P equals zero stuff, we um, got the data to be diverted to the NCSC, not to um, and and uh, the fake emails, not um, not just to disappear, but to be diverted to the NCSC so we could analyze them, and we caught half a billion. 500 million fake emails from people pretending to do HMRC tax refunds and so forth um, in one uh, in one year. So, you know, really, really good, cheap interventions like that. But the final thing was actually about sort of national level risk management, which I think is something that um, we need to sort of come back to. Um, because, um, you know, if I look at, um, you know, if we look at critical infrastructure and we look at what dominated the last two years of my life, it was the uh, row over Huawei and 5G. Um, and you know the um, uh, and I think there is a huge issue here, which the integrated review, if you read that uh, um, prospect piece, which the integrated review handles really well. There's a huge piece here about Chinese technology, um, and the fact that China is really trying to build up. A, it's not like Russia, which is trying to hack America, the, the internet, what America built. China is trying to sort of build its own sort of tech uh, uh, rival system, and us being able to compete with that's really, really quite hard. So I got the whole sort of rise in arguments about Huawei. Way. But then you think back then to the cases that I started this talk with, um, SolarWinds, based in the wonderful city of Austin, Texas, where my, wife, where my wife's from, is one of my favorite cities in the world. Uh, can anyone name me a more quintessentially American company than Microsoft? And yet those are the companies that have been the access points, not Huawei, uh, for the great sort of strategic breaches. So in a sense, whilst, um, you know, I think, uh, you know, to answer Mike's question, uh, are the threats going to be different? In some respects, no, in that we haven't got ransomware under control yet. There will always be digital espionage and so forth. Um, in some respects, yes, because um, I think that it will move from being a single model of the internet, basically built by the American private sector, um, 
uh, where other people play on, some malevolently like Russia, um, uh, it will move from that to a much more complicated contest about who owns the internet, who controls the way it works, who controls the standards um, which regulate how data flow around it and so forth. And it'll get a lot more sort of political, geopolitical, economic and competitive. And so what does that mean? I think for the, if you like, more traditional uh, digital threat, we just have to fix the damn internet. We have to you know, improve resilience of systems. We have to um, uh, uh, make it uh, work better. Uh, we have to sort of merge cyber and non-cyber things like incidents management communications but also things like i mean one of my favorite examples um was of an exercise that we um, were doing um in the uk government about a sort of crisis with another state and the scenario was you know this other state is going to take out the signaling system in the um on the railways outside waterloo station and everybody turned to me and said well what happens now and i said well why don't you ask the department of transport I said, well, um, they said, well, this is the National Cybersecurity Center. It's for you to answer. I said, the question that needs answering is if a hostile state takes out the signaling system in the railways, is which of the following two scenarios come to pass? One, the trains keep running and collide into each other, causing mass fatalities. Or two, the trains all stop in the middle of nowhere, causing mass inconvenience, because those are two completely different things. They're both undesirable, but two is a hell of a lot better than one. And that's the sort of way we need to keep thinking and so forth the but and 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 those and those improvements to generic standards of technology and the resilience of our systems i think are timeless sort of principles but then the new principle is going to be about you know who owns and um, who runs uh, um, uh, the internet and so forth and that's going to be a different and harder problem and i think you'll see cybersecurity get a lot more um uh, you'll see cybersecurity get a lot more sort of political um, however, I think um, sorry, two things are, um, I would say two things by way of finishing, and they're both reasonably optimistic. Uh, one is sort of, you know, just general sort of technocratic optimism, and the other is a bit evangelical. Um, so the, the, the sort of technocratic thing is, um, uh, despite saying that, you know, some of the age old threats are still there and that the new threats are hard. Um, there's a massive generational opportunity to fix some of the problems now because you know, through nobody's fault, um, the for the generation of the internet that we've been using um, for you know 20, 25, 30 years um, was built without security in mind. As I say, it was nobody's fault. It just happened that way. Vince Cerf, the sort of godfather of Google, um, said, when we were building all this, we didn't concentrate enough on those who would want to break the system, and so we ended up with a system which you know you gave away personal data for free, well, free as a non-cash. Uh, um, access to web-based services so a terrible model for security turns out a terrible model for privacy as well but we're not talking about that uh, uh, tonight that like all legacy is only mitigatable it's not strategically fixable but iot is strategically fixable the internet of things are things you can hold they involve hardware that you can have objective measurable trading standards about and software too um 5g ditto uh quantum you know all of these things we can actually you know we know what future technology broadly looks like so we can actually think about how to um build uh, security and resilience uh, uh into it in a way that we conspicuously failed um, to do it so let's do that and let's not let's build it in now and then the final point is just that i think this is a pretty damn good way to spend somebody you know to spend a career you know it's as i say it's not um, it's not uniform military service. It's not frontline uh, military service. But, uh, it's not frontline healthcare service. But we absolutely now need to treat cybersecurity not just as a sort of you know, um, uh, you know great power sort of um, struggle, not just as a risk management for the organisations we're in. But I do think I sometimes wish people hadn't. I understand why and I sort of support why and it makes sense in sort of military and strategic terms, but this whole language about cyber as a domain of operations is true. But I prefer to think, and I'll close with this, I prefer to think of cyber as an environment. Um, you know, it's a it's the first art completely artificially created environment that we all do a lot of um activity in. That activity is primarily peaceful and constructive, despite, you know, all of the um uh, all of the ills. Um, you know, hacks and attacks um, can be pollute, and you know, and digital weaponry can be pollutants in that environment if they're not carefully controlled and so forth. But you know, um, 
cybersecurity is now a public good and an essential public good. And I think that was probably the most valuable and important thing from my complete ignorance of the subject seven years ago to where I am now. So I hope that was vaguely interesting. Um, I can't see whether, um, you know, um, uh, whether anybody finds it or not. But thanks for listening and happy to keep going for a bit. Yeah, thanks a lot for that, Kieran. That was extremely interesting. That's a good point you make about ransomware as well. It's not some random PLA officer who's always the biggest threat to organisations sitting in an office in Beijing. It's a, you know, we've seen collision between more options like Drydex, which are based in Russia, and SFP even sometimes. So yeah, um, I think we've got some questions in the chat as well to follow up on that. Um, we've got two questions from Andrew. So the first one is... Uh, do you think, I think the question is, do you think solar runs was a more of a spray and, take, um, spray and uh, prey attack or was it targeted? So um, I think, uh, given that somebody very kindly did this in the chat, if somebody, um, the best way to answer that in full, given time, is there's an article mm. in a thing called Lawfare, uh, all one word, by Dmitry Alperovich, the founder of CrowdStrike, and some friend of his, I can't remember his name, and it's about the difference between um, uh, SolarWinds and the Microsoft Exchange hack. And it's absolutely superb um, because he's quite technical, but he's also politically astute. And um, so um, because I mean, not just I'm not just saying oh, I read one article and therefore, you know, that's <laughs> um, you know, um, it's, it's a lot more complicated than that. But it concurs with everything I know and have learned about it, that actually it wasn't a spray. Um, so mm. it wasn't um but i'm very happy to, i mean if this was a physical event i'd say why do you think it was but obviously we can't really do it that way um, yeah so really respectfully um uh would like to would like to know more but um i think actually it was a reason i mean it was a pretty careful operation as far as i know yeah cool stuff thanks a lot and um, we have another question from dot dot uh <laughs> what do you think about privacy is privacy dead in the future sorry say that again um what is what, what sorry. is he dead? Oh, sorry. Uh, is, is, uh, what do you think about privacy? Is privacy dead in the future? No, I think it's different. Um, mm. You know, and I think so. Complete privacy of identity. So, I mean, everyone answers questions based on their personal experience. And, and, and yeah. So, you know, forgive me if I think about, but if you think about um, when I was in charge of information security at GCHQ. You know, whoever did that job 50 years ago had it really easy, right? And, you know, organization not acknowledged, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, you know, um, uh, you know, I think the reality is, and the organizations accommodated to this, you know, um, there's a town called Cheltenham, there'll be um, easily available, possibly even public thing, which will say thing, you know, uh, electoral rules and so on that will say, you know, uh, so and so civil servant, and you know what other civil servant uh, employers are there in uh, in Cheltenham? You know, so you know there are things about um, you know, there, there are ways of getting access to um, uh, people uh, and identities um, uh, in ways um, that have not been available before. But so you know, um, uh, and you know the internet never forgets, and you know I've got preteen children and I'm telling them that and all of that so you know privacy is difficult on the other hand you know when I got there and you know there's a whole other conversation about encryption um you know I remember whilst I'm not complete I'm not I'm not a headbanger on um you know the role of the state in encryption and I certainly don't want encryption backdoors or any of that but I remember you know when we were when five years ago you know, the likes of the British and American governments were getting very, very worked up about end-to-end -end encryption. You know, one thing which I, I say as an observation, not as an accusation, one thing that is genuinely true is that for the first time in communications history, there are easily freely available services where you can send content that by design, the state cannot find, right? You know, in the 1650s, and I realize I'm talking to Scotland, so obviously this is pre-union, so I'm being very, very careful that this is not British, <laughs> it's English law. But in the, when the post office was established by, I think it was either Charles I before they cut his head off or by Cromwell, um, but whenever, whoever established the Royal Mail, um, uh, in the chart, in the original charter and law of the Royal Mail, it was, you know, communications of an expectation of privacy but if the state has a legitimate need to open your mail it can and that's been the principle of communications and democracies since democracies 
and communications began until end-to-end -end encryption, you know. So, you know, it's, it's, it, so it comes and goes. So privacy is not dead, but it's changing. So, you know, the, you know, the fact that you exist is far harder to hide than it used to be. But what you say is much more hideable in some respects than it ever was. Yeah, definitely. Sorry, I'm actually lagging quite a lot, so. Oh, don't worry. Um, yeah. Good. Uh, we've got one more question as well uh, before we go on a break. Um, do you think there ought to be more security on IoT devices when they come out of a box, meaning there's le less resili uh, uh, reliance on the consumer to protect their devices? So, um, good question. Completely. I mean, two quick um, examples. This used to drive me nuts, this stuff. Uh, number one, um, if you, anybody remembers the Mirai botnet in 2016 that took down yeah. Amazon through by taking out the DNS provider. Uh -huh. um, and one of the things, because Mirai was so clever, or at least at the time, it seemed really clever because it was hijack a bunch of IoT devices. And so it was just, um, and fire them at something, which just massively increased the DDoS capacity of the um, attackers. And um, one of the biggest uh, contributors was um, uh, a, CC, a set of CCTV cameras. And um, uh, they um, apparently, I uh, was told reliably, um, that they were manufactured in China they had a default password or password which could not be changed but even by a conscientious operator <laughs> you couldn't change the password from password you know that's just not good enough it shouldn't you shouldn't be allowed to do um stuff like that and then actually this time last year just before lockdown i was on the victoria derbyshire show and uh, we were exposing um we were giving parents guidance about um baby cam vulnerabilities and you just thought shouldn't we um shouldn't we have to do this you know what, what, yeah. <laughs> you know, so yes. Sorry, I keep. I think I think I'm lagging again. Right. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's fault, obviously, that way. But yeah. Um. Thanks a lot, Kieran, for coming to see us today. It's such a privilege to speak to someone who's had so much experience and brought up the, the 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 NCSC to what it is today. And,